Okay, so now that we have this tool to really get started with data visualization, sometimes we might want to modify it a little bit further. So you can find this lecture now in day seven for data visualization. And just to recap, we talked yesterday about pivot longer and pivot wider. Pivot longer is gonna be super helpful for getting our data into that long format, which is typically what's needed to create our plots. So keep that in mind. And remember that we have those cheat sheets to help you remember the arguments. And a recap about our join functions. Um, you can always type in question mark join if you don't remember what your join functions options are, and it will pull up in the help here to describe and explain what, what each of these are. It's a little confusing in the way that it describes this, though, because it's really, you know, the left is whatever you put in first in the parentheses on the left side, and the right's going to be whatever is second after the comma in the parentheses. And uh, don't forget your eschizer function. All right, so eschiz stands for sketch or means sketch in French. Uh, we had a little comment about that in the chat. Um, and the idea is that you know it helps us make these plots quickly. And then ggplot, this is the actual hex sticker for the package, um, for each of the packages. So ggplot is, is really what eschiz is using to create these plots. And so we're going to go a little bit into how Askees was creating those plots so that you can know in the future if you want to just write them in ggplot. Eventually, maybe you won't need Askees anymore. Um, and also because sometimes we want to make these modifications that we can't yet do in Askees. So we get the option for more customization. Sometimes you want to put branding. Of, Hopkins or your lab or wherever you are. Um, sometimes you want to make a plot interactive. That can be very useful for certain data to display. Sometimes you want to combine multiple plots together. So all of that we can do now um, beyond a skis. Um, it's also helpful to do easier plot automation. Obviously, like if we have to open up a skis and start doing things uh, manually, in the GUI, that could be a problem if we wanted to automatically generate a lot of plots. Of course, we could try to play around with the data initially and figure out what that code is, but you can see why eventually just knowing how to code it directly could be useful. All right, so what is with this name, ggplot, right? It's kind of a weird name. Um, so gg stands for grammar of graphics. Um, it was created by Hadley Wickham all the way back in 2005, it's part of the tidyverse. And you often might hear people say things like make a ggplot. And what they mean by that phrase is use the ggplot2 package to create the plot. So don't use that, you know, the base R packages that we initially talked about when we were talking about summarizing data. Uh, we used, you know, plot and hiss to create those really simple plots. This is what's going to allow us to make those pretty plots that we've been seeing in Askees. And so there's really nice resources if you want to um, take these further and, and learn more about visualizations that you can do with the ggplot too. It's very powerful. Uh, but yeah, people just say ggplot because, I don't know, adding that extra two takes too much time. <laughs> All right, so the main thing to conceptualize here that's really important about understanding how ggplot2 works is that it layers. So we're going to layer on different pieces of our plot on top of one another. And this has to be done with a plus sign, which is a little bit different. We're not going to be using pipes. We could pipe our data into ggplot, but once we get into ggplot, we need to switch over to using these plus signs to combine the layers of our plots. And that'll be a bit more clear as we go and see some examples. So some people like to make this um, comparison of ggplot to sort of like making a cake. And so we're going to go through some steps um, in terms of how we create a plot. 
And initially, we're always going to have the same base. And so we're going to start with the ggplot function. And then we have to sort of specify our ingredients. So our aesthetics, that's our AES, that's what that stands for. So that's sort of saying like, what variables are we going to use from the data and where are we going to put them in the plot? And then we have, we can do custom tweaks to the scales. We'll talk a little bit about that. We can, but then the main meat of this is going to be creating these geomes, which is, we played a little bit around with this in our Eskiz, uh lab question two, right? We made a different type of plot. And so the geomes help us to create different types of plot plots that we can add to our base. And then theme is what gives us our pretty package of, uh, you know, that we saw in the skis as well, that that could change the outline, the uh, X and Y axis, et cetera. So it helps us to customize it the way that it looks. So the pros here are that ggplot2 is extremely powerful and flexible. We can do amazing things that, um, are not possible with other sort of statistical programming options. Um, and we can do lots of customized things. It is a little bit confusing to understand this grammar of graphics, but we're hoping that um, we're gonna go through it slow enough that it, it makes some sense. But again, you know, use the skis to just sort of get familiar and eventually it'll, it'll start to sink in. If you're wanting to be inspired, there's this really cool, gallery of plots. Um, so a ggplot2 gallery, and you can see all sorts of fancy things that people have done. So you could add, for example, these rectangles onto your plot to, you know, really emphasize points. You can add text to your plots to say which point is which data, or you can, you know, add a label. So it's here, we're just specifying two particular, or three particular points of interest. You can add arrows, you can add lines, um, you can add these really cool marginal plots. There's so much. Um, so if you, if you wanna check out more, definitely look into that. And then uh, the other resources that we had in our slides as well, the case studies has some pretty fancy plots as well. All right, so the important thing though is when we're making our plots, it's really important to have our data in the right format to actually play nicely with ggplot2. And so it needs to be in the tidy format. Um, so basically what tidyverse likes. And tidy data means that each variable is a unique column and each observation is a unique row. So it starts to get messy when we have columns that are things like an underscore and it has multiple data inside of it because that gets hard to plot. Um, and then our column names, our column headers are values and, and not data. When we do that, you know, that can also be, get tricky. We want to be able to neat, um, plot what our column headers actually are. So we want to avoid that as well. Um, and again, having our, our variables stored, multiple things stored in one column is problematic, as well as um, storing the same data across columns and rows. So you want to try to avoid those things. Uh, it's a little easier to see what I mean by this with examples. So that's what we're going to go do now. So for example, here, we have column headers that are actually values, like we can see that they're sort of variable names, but they could also give, they also give us information on a scale. So here we have information about income brackets um, and various counts for various religions. So if we wanted to make this tidier and create it, uh, pivot it to be in long format, then we could take those column values those column headers and make this a new variable, which is income. And then we have our count still, which is just what our rows, our row values were, and we have repeated our religion value. So this looks really similar, I think, hopefully, to what we saw yesterday 
when we were pivoting data from wide to long, where we sometimes repeated um, a variable value um, so that we could twist, you know, move all these data points to be in this long format, rotating it essentially. And so we're going to work with some data about orange trees. Um, and that comes directly in R. So if you just type in capital O R N G O R A N G A N G E, I can't speak today apparently, um, then you'll see this data set. So I'm gonna show that here. Um, I'm gonna, if I run this here, I can see information about the records of the growth of trees. It gives me some information about the data set here. Um, I guess this is data from 1968 for some of these trees, um, tracking their age and their diameter. And so if I take a look at it, I see that I have numbers, ID numbers for these trees, their age in days since the state here uh, 1231, 1968, and their circumference, which is in millimeters. In case you're into plants and trees. So we're going to create some plots with this data. So our first kind of plot, we need to initially make that base of our cake, right? And so our first thing, step that we're going to do is create an empty plot that just indicates that we're making a plot plot itself, which is this gg plot function, and specifying what our ingredients are for our cake. So we'll generate something like this, an empty plot where we have our axes set up. And so here we have our gg plot function, and then we're just going to put in the data that we intend to work with and create a plot out of. And then we're going to have some arguments that specify how we're creating the axes for our plots. So we'll call, this is the mapping argument. It's not required that you write mapping, you could skip it, but it does sort of help you remember what it is that you're actually doing. And then you're saying it for the aesthetics, x, the x-axis will be this variable, the y-axis will be this variable. Um, so here in our example, we're using the orange data. Our mapping is going to be the circumference data for the x variable or for the x-axis and the age variable for the y-axis. And so if I do this over here, And I say, what did I want to do? X is circumference. And y is H. All right, so in my setup, I have the default setup. I know Ava has hers set up differently and maybe Cliff as well to where they have their output print to the console or the plots and they don't have a preview in their R markdown file. Um, if you have the default set up, you're going to see it up here. If I don't like that and I really want to see it in my plot pane, I would just copy paste this here into the console and now I can see it in the plot pane. So a couple of ways to see our plots. So again, we're making sort of the base of our plot, the base of our cake, but we have to tell ggplot what kind of plot we want it to be or what kind of cake. Uh, so that we can see the rest of the plot. And that's when our geomes come in. So we have a variety of options to choose from. Um, these are a few that are pretty common. So geome point creates a point or scatter plot. We've seen that. Geome line is going to have lines that connects uh, various observations or points. Uh, G geom box plot creates box plot, histogram creates a histogram. Bar, they're fairly self-explanatory. Col stands for column. 
which is like a variation of bar plot. There's some differences there that we'll talk about. And tile makes these sort of like heat maps. And if you were curious and you didn't quite remember, um, you know, you could be working on your plot and type in geome and they'll come up and you can scroll through and it will give you information about what these look like. Um, so um, I think we've talked about this a bit, but our, it's hard sometimes to know when to use what plot. And if you're interested in more information about this, we have a resource on our website. So again, there's lots of helpful things here. There's a guide on when to use which plot, information on how to make nice themes, and also just best practices, as well as that ggplot2 gallery. So if you want extra information, please do check that out. Typically, um, sometimes you'll just make an odd looking plot, <laughs> and then you'll recognize that, oh, maybe this isn't the best plot. Um, yeah, so that, that will also happen. Um, so just a, a brief discussion about like when you might choose a particular plot. So our scatter plots or geom point is really helpful when we want to look at the relationship between two continuous variables. So not categorical variables, but numeric to numeric variables. Um, but then once we get into some sort of categorical or string value, character value variables, then it might be better to use a bar plot or a box plot uh, where we would have different categories on our X axis and then, you know, some sort of numeric value on our Y axis. So the type of variables that we're working with really helps us to dis determine what type of plot might make sense. Um, a histogram is when we just want to look at the distribution of the numeric data, so that's going to need to be numeric data. Um, and then really box plots when you're comparing two groups tends to be uh, one of the best options. So I think I make box plots more than anything else. Uh, okay, so but back to our example. So if we're working with our base of our plot and we want to add on to our plot and add some points or some bars or some lines, we have to do that with our geome function. So they all start with this geome underscore. Importantly, we need that plus sign. So here I already started doing that. I have my plus sign and it might look a little bit nicer if I spread it out. It's good practice to sort of put it at the end of the line so you can see where that is and make sure that you're coding it correctly. So I recommend doing that. So, okay, let's see, um, I think a scatter might make, oops, a plot point scatter might be a good option. And I can just leave that open because I've already specified what I'm gonna have for my data. And so now that I've added this layer to my plot, I've gone from just having this base, this gray base, and added the points to the plot. And so now I, I have points that are my given values of circumference, circumference for given values of age. Okay, so it's really important that the placement of that plus sign be in the correct place. So if I try to do something like this, where I start a new line after my code, but before the plus sign, like this, and I try running that, it's not going to work. So it's really picky, unfortunately, about where the placement of that plus sign is. So it's a good idea to just have everything on a new line after your plus sign. It also is not compatible with pipes. So you can, like I said, pipe data into this. So I could do something like this and I could manipulate the orange data if I want to with pipes. But ultimately I would just pipe it to ggplot, the ggplot function. And then after that, everything needs to be these plus signs. So this will work. But if I mistakenly put a pipe, it's not gonna work. 
and I'll get some error that is kind of confusing. Um, and, you know, it's pretty helpful. It's saying it's gotten better over time and it's saying, did, did you maybe mean a plus sign here? So watch out for that. Okay, uh, importantly, you can also save your plots to be an object. Um, so you can assign them to something. So here, I can assign it to just like any other data object, any kind of name that I want. So in this case, I'm gonna call it plot one. And then when I run this, I'm not gonna see the plot. I'm just gonna generate the plot and assign it to this value. And I can see it here in my environment. And if I actually want to see the plot later, I'd have to just call the name of the plot. And again, remember that if I hate seeing stuff up here in my preview, my R markdown, and I wanna see it in the pane, I would just type it in the console. All right, so um, let's see a couple of examples. We've already done a little bit of this with the skis, but how we would do this here. We really don't change anything else except for that geom. So if I wanted to create this other type of line plot, all I have to do is change point to line and that will make this new, um, this new plot. So all I have to do here is change this to line. Sometimes you have to run it twice. So if it previews as empty, you just need to run it again. So I had to do that just now. Uh, but here I can see that I've changed it to a line plot. And it's just connecting the points that we had before. And here I've just saved it to two different objects and then printed both of them. All right, I can actually, again, like I talked about with this layering concept, I can have multiple plots on top of one another. So in this case, I've done a geom point plot and then I've just combined it. And again, remember I gotta be using that plus sign and it's gotta be at the end of the, each line. Uh, and then just added this geom line on top. So in our case, we already have a geom line. So maybe I'll add a geom point on top. Either way is fine. The only difference is if my line is covering up my points, then I might want the point on top. And so, you know, it looks like a really complicated plot, but what's happening underneath here is we've made three different layers, right? The first line here is to create that base. The second line was to add the geom line, and the top is to add the geom point. And again, we can do it whatever order. Um, the only difference is that the thing that was most recent is what's going to be on top. So it, we would actually cover up the line completely when we have our geom point on top at those points. All right. Um, and then it can be helpful to add color. And this is where ggplot gets a little bit more tricky. Um, so it might be useful to see all of our different trees um, based on color. And we're going to add that to the aesthetic part of our initial ggplot function. And it's important that we do it there because we'll see that in a little bit later on some other slides of troubleshooting that if we do things differently, um, sometimes we can generate unwanted <laughs> artifacts. So here I've just added color here to the aesthetic of the mapping function, the your ggplot function. And now I've you know, split my line based on the different trees within our data because I had one other variable in our data, which was different trees. So now we're just seeing that split up. But I can also do really fancy things. Some of this you can still do in uh, a skis, but we start to get 
this is when we start to get beyond a skis um, with some of the more customization. So here what I've done is I've changed the size of the points. I've specified how big I want them to be. So I've made them quite large um, and I've made the line size relatively small. I've changed the color of the points to be red. I've changed the color of the line to be black. I've changed the type of line that I wanna use. So there's various different line types. Uh, you can find them, um, keys for these online and we'll give some resources there. And so in this case, I want this dashed line. And then I want to specify an, a level of see-throughness for my points so that since I have my point on the bottom of my line plot, I want um, to see some of that. And so I can specify here that I want them to be a little bit see-through. And so those are some, some of the types of fancy things that we could do um, to our plot. So we're gonna add these specifications to our geome level. So here I'm gonna make my points larger. I'm just gonna say size equals five to my geome point. And now I have much bigger points on my plot. All right. Um, so those are you know pretty fine-grained details. So we just sort of want you to be aware that you can do that if you want. And indeed, a lot of that can be done in a skis. So just wanted to let you know. But if you wanted to do really fine-grained detail, you can um, you can do that directly in ggplot. So we're going to talk a little bit more about sort of this outside theme or what, what the exterior of the plot and the general feel of the plot is. And that's with our, our theme function. So here I have the exact same plot that I had previously. So that plot, except I guess I've changed from black to brown here. But otherwise, I have the same plot. And all I'm adding is this theme function. And we saw this in a skis. Ava played around with some of the theme functions. And all we do here is add yet another layer with our plus sign and one of the theme functions. So we can either look at these through R directly, which I'll show in a second, or we could click on this link and it would take us to a variety of themes. And what it's doing is just it's adding a bunch of um, code that we don't have to specify, which is going to change the way our plots look. And this has like an example of what all of them look like. Or you can just play around with it. So in R, I have to add my plus sign. And as I type theme, I can see that a bunch of options are coming up. And so I can just also see them here in my um, in my R studio. So if I wanted to change this to theme dark, just like the example, that's simply all I would do. Or I could change this to classic. Try this again. And it, you know, it changes the overall look of my plot. Um, it can get, this is another thing that we can't do in a skis. If I really want to change elements to a very minute degree, I could do something like changing the text. And to do that, I would need to use the theme function. So I don't have that underscore, I just have the general theme function. So here I would add on to this and I say theme, and you can see all of these things pop up for various attributes that I can change on my plot and customize. And so here it's telling me, it's shortening the list a little bit here. Um, I can change all of the text within my plot to be a particular size or look. Um, and so this, this part's relatively tricky. And if you want to, to do this sort of thing, you know, this is where typing in theme is really useful and reading in the documentation. So here we see some of the options for things that we can put into theme. 
these are kind of sort of the top basic things that we could do. This is going to change all of the text. This is going to change all of the titles. And then we get into more specific things like just the X axis title, just the Y axis title. Maybe I want to change where it's located, et cetera. So there's all kinds of stuff. We're not going to go through everything. I haven't even done all of these things. Um, but you know, there's a lot that you could work with. So here in this example, we're changing all of the text in the plot. We have to specify, this part's kind of tricky, the element that we're working with, we're working with text. And so again, we, we type in part of it and part of it comes up. Here I see, it wouldn't make sense to be working with text and then say rectangle. Um, no, I need to say that I'm working with text. And then it, it shows me all the things that I could change. I could change the family, the face, the size. So if I say size equals 16, I'm gonna make it a different, I'm gonna specify the size. And then family here is Comic Sans is gonna change the font. All right, and now I have this sort of like more casual looking font for all of my text and it's a uh, larger, so it's easier to read. It's a, a nicer, friendlier looking plot. I can also change my labels. This is really important. This is something you can do in a skis as well, um, but if you wanted to code it, you could do that directly in ggplot. There's a function called labs, oops. A little too small for me. There we go. Um, so labs, which is short for labels. Um, and I'm going to say that I can add a title to my plot with the title argument. I'm just going to call it plot for now. Very exciting, I know. And I can specify my x axis as. Um, my x-axis is my circumference. I'm going to change it to circ and millimeters. I need to put all of that in quotes because I'm doing character strings. And I'm going to make my y days. And I can see that it has updated my plot. So here we see here the labs function. I can change the title for each of my axes as arguments within that function. And uh, if I wanted to add line breaks, this is something that would be hard to do in a skis. So maybe I could do everything in a skis, but then I want to add this nice line break. Um, I could add that here. I guess it might let you do it, but. If it doesn't, this would be an option. So basically, this is a we're telling it to add a new line, um, and that's going to break up our our uh, title of our plot here, so that we have a new line for that second half of the title, which can be nice. You can also have subtitles, which is an option too. So I could say. I'm feeling really uh, creative with my names today. <laughs> There's my subtitle. All right. It can be really important to be able to change our scale. And to do that, there are a couple of functions. If we're using a continuous variable, a numeric variable, that's not a factor, doesn't have some ordinal significance. Uh, but something like this, where we're working with a scatter plot, it can be useful to change how it's plotted. And so this can help me to figure out, like, I don't want this to be by 400. I want this to be more specific so it's easier to tell where the points are actually plotting. Um, then I could do that here and I could specify what breaks I want to have. So I want to start from 20 and go all the way to 240 and do it by 20, for example. So I could do that for my x-axis. Um, 
and my y-axis. In this case, I'm going to go 100 to 1600 by 200. And I could do this also specifying a min or a max um, if I don't know exactly what I want to do. I'm going to copy paste this as an example. This might make typos. So remember, I've got to add that plus sign, very important. And I've got to have a, an enter, I gotta have a new line after that plus line. So when I do this now, I have more information on my y-axis. A little easier to read what's happening. Um, so we can see here what that did in this example, where we add, changed both the x-axis and the y-axis. And so just like this plot, we see more information for the y-axis, but we also have more information for the x-axis. And this was our default. So sometimes that's nice to do. Um, sometimes you want to specify a particular limit for a particular axis, and we can use the x limit or the y limit for that. Um, so the reason we might want to do this is maybe we have like a weird outlier at the very end, or we um, need more space, uh, or we want to zoom in on particular points. So I could say X limit in this case, I've decided an example that I'm going to not plot anything above 100. I only want to focus on the points below. 100, um, or between, sorry, starting at 100, that's going to be my minimum, and my max is going to be the actual max of the values, and this is one of those cases where we have to pull the data. Oops, helps to spell the name of the data correctly. So just like this, I am getting the maximum amount of the circumference data values from orange. And anytime, this is just like when we did summarization, anytime we do some sort of mathematical thing, we have to do um, a vector. So we have to pull out the values. It's giving me some warning because I removed data. I mean, I consciously did that just now. So <laughs> that's no surprise to me. And so now my data is only starting at 100 because I removed all the points below that. All right. So in summary for this section, um, which sort of gives us a taste of a lot of ggplot here. And again, like I know that a lot of this is complicated and confusing and weird language, um, but that's why you can just start with your nice looking plot from a skis. And then if you wanna do anything fancy, then you know coming to these slides could help you. So in summary, we create a plot in general. It's the first step we have to do. We have to say that we're creating a plot using the ggplot function. And then inside of that, we would have our mapping argument where we specify our aesthetics and we say what variables we're plotting for X and Y if we're plotting both of both the axes, and we might specify the color or the fill for our data. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and then layers have to be combined with this plus sign. It has to be at the end of the line. We have to do a new line after them um, and not before them. The theme functions can help us to change the overall look um, when we have something beyond it. So theme underscore something. The individual theme function can help us to do lots of customized things for size, color, et cetera. We can also add some of these to a particular geome if we wanted to. Um, and then the labs, L-A-B-S, is the label function. And that's where we can add our title and our X and Y labels. And we can use this line break if we wanted that. We can limit the plot with X limb or Y limb. And then if we want particular breaks, we can use the scale X continuous or scale Y continuous function. And one note that's really important, by default, ggplot is going to remove our missing values from plots. 
So, um, you know, that's something to keep in mind if you want to make sure that you show your missing values. And we'll talk a little bit more about all those things. Um, and with that, we could move on to our lab. All right. So now we're going to talk about some, I don't know, deeper discussions about things that can go wrong in ggplot, things that we can specify, and um, some nuance that we might experience. So we briefly talked about the theme function and how that can enable us to do additional changes to our code um, to make things look a little bit differently aesthetically. And so um, we're going to go a little bit deeper into the details on that. But again, this is like probably the trickiest part about ggplot, and a lot of it can be achieved using a skis. So you can always, you know, play think play with things around with things there. And then if you, there's something additional that you want to specify, you can come to these slides. So um, here we're changing our plot title. Sometimes we want the text for a plot title to be a little bit different than the rest of the font. And so all we're doing here is adding this theme function here and specifying that we want to work on the plot title. That's an element that's text and we're specifies, specify, blah, blah, specifying that we want the size to be font 20. And so here we can see that we have a nice large uh, plot title. So I'm going to sort of make this a little bit less complicated here. We've done something similar here where we had done all of the text, but I could instead just work on the plot title. Again, I can just hesitate and wait for all these things to show up, and then I don't have to do as much. I have this extra plus sign, so it's thinking that I'm not complete. Um, and so now that's made my plot look a little bit different. It's not, so notice that this has my Comic Sans font and everything else now has this more like aerial looking font. So it's hard, it's, how do you know what all these elements are and when it's an element text, et cetera? Um, so let's go through that a little bit. So, uh, Again, we can use this question mark theme to check out the um, information about this function. And that's, again, going to give us all the types of things that we could specify differences for if we wanted to customize. So we can do lots of things with the legend or the back panel, for example. And this is really how all of those particular themes are, are happening. The strip is for when we use facets. Um, we'll talk more about that in a second. But so uh, if we read through the documentation, we'll get some pretty nifty information about this. But we'll see that there's you know these elements that we can specify. And then whatever aspect that we're changing about these would either be one of the following. Element text, that's generally going to be when you're doing something like a title. Element line, if you're working on something that's a line or has lines, rect for rectangle or element blank. This is if you maybe want to remove something. And then inside we can change things like the size, the color, the fill, the face being, you know, the font or something, um, how see-through it is or not, the angle. Sometimes it's nice to angle font la or text labels, particularly for the x-axis. Uh, where we put position something, this is typically for the legend. Uh, for a rectangle, we're going to do size, color, fill, line type. And generally for line, there's not too much, just size, color, and line type. So these are, if you kind of, this is a summary basically of the types of things that you would be able to change for each of these particular things. And so this kind of takes, requires some experience just playing around with it. One of the most 
sort of awkward and confusing things to do that a lot of people want to do is to center their title. And so to do this in ggplot, you could do this with eskies. Um, so don't worry about that. But if you wanted to know how to code this, you would say that I want to work with my plot title within your theme function. I'm working with text, so that's an element text. And I'm going to horizontally justify it for h just to 0.05. And then here I'm just specifying the size. And that is going to center our, our title. So here I have, I'm working on my title as well. So I would, could just add this h just equals 0.05 to the way that I'm working with my text for my plot title as well. And now I see that plot is nicely in the center of the plot output here. Again, you can do this in a skis though, if <laughs> this gets confusing, because this is something that people typically struggle a little bit with. Um, uh, we can also, you know, specify a particular plot axis. So maybe I have lots of words for one of my axes. And so I'm going to maximize the size for one of them in a different way than I would maximize the size for the other. So you can, you can decide whether you want to do a particular font for all of your axes or a particular axis. So I could do something like um, inside here, let's just do one of these. Yeah, so I could, I'll pull it up. Instead of axis title, I do axis title X for the X axis. And it's kind of nice to have this other font because I can see that that's very different here than my Y axis. But if I wanted to do both, I would just say axis title, and that's going to do both of them. Uh, one of the other most useful things that you can do with theme is to remove the legend. So there are times where this would not be a good case, but if we had a um, box plot and we're already specifying what things are on the x-axis, and we don't really need a legend to also tell what it is. So that would be a time to remove the legend. And so we can just specify that with the theme function here. Um, I'm just gonna delete this to make it similar, simpler. Uh, so if I type in legend, it comes up and I can use background. Oh, let's do position actually. And I can just specify that there is no position for it because it does not exist. It's mad about something. Oh, extra parentheses here, which our error gives some hints for, which is nice. All right, and so now I no longer have a legend anymore. But again, I, I probably wouldn't want to do it in this case for this plot, but it would be good for a box plot. Theme is probably the most tricky part. If I want to check out, you know, a, a sort of systematic guide for how to do all of these manipulations, this is a really helpful cheat sheet uh, that you can find in the slides here. Um, and you can also make your own theme. So remember how we have these really nifty themes that we can add, you know, just by saying theme. I already have classic up here, so I'm going to remove that. Um, you know, that's going to change a bunch of different things about the plot. So that's adding, you know, these grid lines. It's making them gray. Um, so that's basically just doing a bunch of individual theme changes to my plot, but I don't have to code them. So it could be that you end up having a style that you really like for a particular report and you've colored everything the way that you like. You could create your own theme and then just reuse it by adding something like this um, and, you know, naming it something in particular. 
So if you're interested in doing that, that's not something we cover in the course, but there's this really nice uh, tutorial. All right, so another aspect that we're gonna talk about is grouping uh, variables. And so to do this, we're gonna use another data set. And I'm gonna put this in the chat on our website. And it's about food prices, which would be important, you know, if we're looking at things like um, food access. So I'm just reading this with our read CSV function and specifying the file. I'm using quotes. And I'm going to take a look at my data. All right, so I've got here two different categories. I've got pasta and rice items, um, but I have a different two different examples of each of these. So I have four different total items, and I have an item ID for each of them. And then I have uh, time points, ten different time points where the price change has been um, added to this data set so that we can look at how prices have changed over time. If I were to plot this data and I just wanted to look at observation time, so you know looking at four or 10 different observations, and I'm looking at oops, wrong way, the price change. So these two variables, and I use GeoMline, I get kind of a weird looking plot here, right? It looks sort of like a sawtooth. Um, this is puzzling, right? It's hard to interpret what's happening, I think. And so anytime things look a little confusing, you might want to investigate a little bit more. And this can happen as, in a skis as well. So this might be an instance where we would want to introduce something called groups. Let me see if I can reproduce this over here. So I'm using my food data. I could pipe this into ggplot or I could just put it in directly like this. I use my AES function to specify what X and Y are. X is gonna be observation time. Y is going to be item price change. Um, and then I'm going to add geom line. Okay, so I reproduced it over here. And now if I add this group of the item ID, and remember item ID, is that information about the actual individual, um, you know, type of rice or pasta that someone could buy. Then I'm going to change the manner in which this is plotted. Notice that this is in the aesthetic um, the aesthetic uh, AES function. All right, so that looks a lot more interpretable. I have four items. I've gotten rid of my legend somehow here. So I'll probably wanna figure out what that is, which we'll do in a second. But I can see that there's lines that kind of make some more sense, right? It's a little more easy to see what's happening over time. So uh, since I, I'm interested in actually seeing different colors, instead of using group, I can use color for that. And now I can see exactly what's happening here. Like this is the change of item ID one, of item two, et cetera. But I kind of got lost in terms of what's rice and what's pasta. So what happens when I add that in? If I do item category, I still have groups within, I have individual data points, right? Within these two categories that are, are changing pretty erratically. 
So then I get back to this sort of sawtooth look, which isn't great. So the way I can overcome that is I can both color by item category and use that group option. And that makes things quite nice. So my group is going to be the item ID, and my color is going to be um, my item category. Missing a comma. All right. Now it's easier to see what's going on. We've got two rice things, items, and two pasta items, and they're changing over time. It might be nice to show this in um, a facet, which we saw a little bit with a skis, and we can do that using the facet grid function or a facet wrap function. So facet grid is going to create a grid, um, whereas facet wrap is going to be a little bit more flexible and we'll see what those look like. So if I wanted to do this, I simply just add a plus sign and then I use one of these functions. And then I would use my tilde and whatever variable it is that I want to be, you know, splitting up my plots by. Um, in this case, I'm doing item category. And so now I'm seeing, um, you know, my pasta information on one plot and my rice on the other. Notice though here that the, the y-axis is the same for both of these. And while that might be fine in this case, there are instances where I might want a little more flexibility with that, and that's where facet wrap might be more useful. So we'll look at that in a second. But here in our example of following along, I might add facet grid and say that I want to facet by item category. And I forgot to add my plus sign. So I lost everything. <laughs> there we go. Just, just you know, showing these examples. <clears throat> All right. So uh, if we want something more flexible, like where we can, you know, have different y-axes, we could use this facet wrap function. And we can specify how many rows or columns that we want. Um, so here, everything looks just the same as the other. I've just used wrap instead of grid here, but I'm still using my tilde sign for the variable that I want to be using. And I've decided that I'm going to have one column, which is going to have you know everything stacked on top of each other. And I'm saying I can add this new uh, argument that I can't do for grid, which says scales free, which allows my... Um, my y-axis to be different and my x-axis it just happens to be similar but I, it allows those to change and uh, show you know the data a little bit closer with uh, different limits for our scales so to do that i would change this to wrap and i'm just going to do scales free here I'm not going to specify how many columns. Oh, yes, that should be a comma. Got so excited about my plus signs, you know, because we need those for most things here. Um, yeah, so now I have a different axis, axis uh, scale for my y-axis for each of these. All right. Um, so... Ava touched on this in a skis, but uh, when we do color versus fill for different types of plots, we can get a difference. So uh, this is a, a tip here. If you're using a box plot or a column plot or um, something like that, it'd be useful to, you probably want to fill in the entire thing with color as opposed to just coloring the outside of that object. Um, so on the left here, we're seeing when we specify with color, and on the right here, we're seeing when we use fill. So keep that in mind. That's a common confusion point. Um, and then we can also add nice things, especially for box plots, 
it's really nice sometimes to show the points on top of it. And so we could do that with a layer called geom jitter. And you can specify the width of this to make it a little more narrow. So I'm just going to copy paste this to show you what I mean. So if I don't specify a width, you'll notice that my, my points are just kind of like randomly everywhere and it's kind of hard to tell what's going on. And here I have them nicely lined up. Uh, we talked about how the Viridis uh, color scale is really helpful for color vision uh, differences. And so to be inclusive to people who, you know, we want everyone to be able to see the differences between our groups. So it's important to be mindful of that um, and so we can do so with some functions that are for either the discrete uh, categorical variables. Uh, so that would be like our pasta and rice. And we would just simply add it to our, our plot and that would change the coloring. Or if we were using a continuous variable, like say we were just you know, doing a scatter plot of item price and something else. Um, then that's where we would want to use the underscore C option. And so all I have to do here to change the color is just simply add this. That's it. It's pretty nice. Um, you wanted to point out again that you can you can do lots of wrangling you can get your data into the right format like maybe you're mostly using the wide data and you want to make the data long before you put it into ggplot you could do all of that and just pipe it directly into your uh, ggplot function so here we're doing something a little different we're grouping by the item category and doing some summarization getting the max item price um, and then piping that directly into ggplot. So it's something to keep in mind. If you do color um, outside of your AES function, so here I'm just taking this plot that already exists that looks like this, where I have you know two, two bars, um, and I want to add a border to it. I can change the color here, not by putting it in the AES function, because that would, um, you know, I want to fill mostly just, you know, think about how I want to fill it. If I were to use add on color item category, you know, that would basically just do the same thing. So that's not very useful. Um, but say I want to add a black outline, I would do that separately in the geome itself. And remember that color for a geome column or box plot or things like that, it's going to change the color of the border, the outside of our um, data plot. So, you know, this can be nice if we want some sort of outline. Uh, geome column and geome bar are kind of similar, but they're a little bit different. So, geome bar, you only have one mapping, you have one variable that you can plot, where in geome column you can have two. So I get tripped up by that. Um, overall, generally, it's good to check what you're plotting and make sure that it, it makes sense. So here, you know, we've plotted our item price change for rice and pasta. And for item ID and three and four, we're seeing an item price change of 40 and 60. Does that seem right? Would we have a change like that? Probably not, right? So something something weird has happened here. Um, and so it's important to you know check the plot and make sure that it's right. So in our case here, we might want to group by our item ID, um, check the summary and, and look at the sum here. And when we do that, we see that that's what we're actually plotting here. We're plotting the sum of all these price changes as opposed to an average or something like that that we might want to plot. So be really careful to look at your plot and make sure that it's actually showing what you think it is. 
So here we probably want to do mean. So we'd probably want to, you know, summarize the data first and then use that to plot. Yeah, so here we could now take that summarized data, put it into ggplot, and now that looks much better. Our y-axis is not showing a change of $60 for our price change. Yeah, it by default will do this like sort of turquoise and coral color. Um, it just it's just what it does. The reason there's any color here is that we've specified that we want to fill it by item item category, and then yeah, it's just decided to do this default coloring. But if I don't like that, I can you know do something like this with my scale viridase uh, underscore d for discrete. Which I think I still have here. Yes. This. Um, uh, make sure that your labels aren't too small. If you make your labels really small, it can make it really hard for people trying to read your plots to understand what's happening. So it's a good idea to make them nice and big. Also, typically when you copy paste a plot into your actual uh, you know, manuscript or whatever it is that you're doing, it's going to get shrunk and down. So it's a good idea to make them quite large. Uh, a little note about outliers. Often it's useful to remove outliers. Maybe we have one that's just really, really big, uh, just off the charts, right? And it changes the scale of our y-axis. So we could change our y limit, and then that would remove that point, and it would get a little warning from R that we're removing that. Or we could just remove all of them um, and we would do that with this outlier dot shape equals NA argument. So if you end up having outliers that you don't like, this is a way to you do that. Um, but you know, be you know, be transparent that you've done that when you describe your your plot. So it's really just going to remove the outliers of um, n cases, in this case, um, of this data So um, for each category. So you know we're really only plotting one categorical, I'm sorry, one continuous variable in this case. So it's removing the outliers for that variable. Yeah, I think in that case, the best way to do that is to just reduce the limit of um, the plot and have it not plot this one outlier. So you just say like Y limit zero to 15 or something. Um, and then for NA values, we talked a little bit about this, that if it's a numeric value, it's just going to get dropped from the plot. So if you had um, a scatter plot, R doesn't know what to do with those NA values. So where should it put that point? So it just doesn't make that point. So that's what happens to those values. But if it's categorical, like in a bar plot situation, we're going to have them. Um, and so if we don't want them, we can filter them out. So here we have like some data set where we have some ice cream flavors and some of them are NA values, right? Um, if we plot this, uh, we'll automatically see that NA category and the count for that. But uh, in our version two here, we just have to drop the NA values for that flavor uh, that variable, which is our X axis variable. So just, you know, make sure you do a drop NA or whatever it is that you're, you're plotting on your X, X axis if you don't want them. All right, uh, some extensions, just wanna briefly go over some really cool things that you could do. Uh, the patchwork package is super cool if you want to combine plots. So it's really simple to use. You just need to save your plot to some objects. And then you basically sort of think about it in a mathematical way. So here we're showing, this is plot one, this is plot two. We, we put a plus sign to say that we're going to have them next to each other, and then we use a dividing sign to say that we want plot two on the bottom. And I'm using parentheses to indicate that I want them 
you know, I want that entire plot underneath these two plots. I don't know why you'd repeat the same plot, but this was just an example because I already had those objects. Um, so if we wanted to test this out, you know, I could save this plot to something. I think I already have a plot one in my environment. So, you know, these are, are different um, packages. So we would have to install Patchwork and load it. And then we would be able to print them next to each other. I'm just going to do that briefly. And so here we have, we already have a plot one, like I said, in my environment. I can see it over here from before. I can just say, I want to plot them next to each other. So here I can see that I've plotted them next to one another. Or if I just wanted one over the other, I would do the division. over here so you can see it. yeah one on top so that can be useful if you do lots of combinations of plots if you end up doing lots of plots where you have a lot of different categorical variables that you do multiple continuous variables for so for example I'm plotting a continuous variable for the x and y but I have, you know, two different items for pasta and rice. But let's say that I have a lot of them and I want to indicate which one's which. I don't have to have a legend. I could actually label the individual lines. And so the direct labels package is really cool for that. I'm not going to show an example of that. But if that's something that you encounter, I recommend that. And then if you want to make interactive plots, Plotly is super cool. So you just load the package, you have to install it as well. And then you would just say ggplotly around the name of the plot. And that's it. And it will make it interactive. And then I can do cool things like this and see the individual point and the information about it. There's also a package called uh, giraffe or ggiraffe um, that does similar things. All right, and then saving plots. Um, Ava already showed us how we can do things like, you know, we have this plot here. I can click this little export button and decide to save it in various ways. Um, or if I zoom in on that, I could do something similar. So I could click the zoom. Are you seeing that pop up? Probably not. Are you seeing? No. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can add a new share. All right. Where did my pop up go? Zoom is not making that easy. Anyway, when you press Zoom, perhaps you can see it on the side. I don't know. Um, you should be able to save it from there as well if you wanted to like sort of change the dimensions of the plot. That's a nice way to do it. Or you can do it in code. And you would just do gg save and you would specify the file name and a path if you want it somewhere else than just your working directory. You would specify the plot that you're just the name of the plot that you've saved it to. Um, and then if you wanted to change dimensions, you can do that for inches by default. All right, so in summary, we talked about theme. That's how we change lots of aspects related to our plot. Don't worry too much about this. We can do a lot of it in um, the skis, but if you know you really want to code it yourself, this is how you would do it. Um, sometimes you need to think about grouping elements. So if you start to get that sawtooth look or something looks weird, maybe take a look at that. If something looks weird in general, also make sure that your plot is actually plotting what you think it is. So check it. You might be plotting the sum of a bunch of values when you don't realize it. Um, facet grid and facet wrap is how we make those really cool split up plots. Um, facet wrap is the one that allows us to have different scales. Um, you want to use fill if you want to fill in the color of a box plot rather than the color. 
And um, if you want more information about good practices or best practices, you can check out this guide. It's also on the resource page of the website. All right.